Welcome back. You enjoyed, you enjoyed your lunch? Had time to, enough time to have lunch. Okay, great. Okay. Welcome back. Now we shall continue with our lectures. So, guys, let us hear the video. Please welcome Tomasz Kowalczyk, software architect with over 10 years of experience in web applications industry. Everyone is talking about blockchain, so let's deep dive. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my, to my talk. Thanks for your interest in blockchain. The blockchain is a, is a solution that was popularized by cryptocurrencies. But in this talk, I want to tell you that it doesn't need to be so, because it is as any technical solution can be used in virtually all kinds of projects. And whether you are building something called for e-commerce, something logistic-based, fintech, or even a cryptocurrency, the blockchain can help you solve your own problems. So it's like any technical solution can help you in a good way, can help you in a wrong way, and especially in the case of blockchain, you really need to triple check whether you need that solution, because it's, it's really, it's a little bit harder to implement than the usual solutions, but still, if you have that use case, it's simply indispensable. My name is Tomasz Kowalczyk. I came here from Poland, from Warsaw, in a lovely two-hour flight. The, look, the landscape were really mar marvelous. I'm interested in virtually all kinds of techno the hard technological solutions. I mean, especially those that involve uh, very, uh, let's say, sophisticated uh, technical decisions. And in the case of blockchain, th this technology involves ma 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 very big amounts of ma maps of cryptography. So I'm naturally attracted to it. Right now, I'm working as a software architect at the company called GOG.com. Uh, you may have heard about, about GOG because it is, it is a shop with, with, uh, with uh, DRM-free games, but we are a part of, of a, bigger, a bigger company called CD Projekt, which uh, created the game The Witcher. And we provide all kinds of uh, technological uh, solutions for the infrastructure of them, uh, for them. And uh, my job as a software architect is to guide the software approaches in, in the whole company, pro provide solutions, provide designs, and, and so on. So before we will delve, into the vast world of, of blockchain, let's talk about some definitions, because probably all of you have heard the word blockchain, but probably we could get at least a few definitions of what blockchain is. So for me, and during this talk, I, I will, I will uh, be um, taking this definition, the blockchain is basically a database, because blockchain for me is not the network, is not the application, is not something else, it's just the data. Just, it's just a technical solution for a certain data storage that provides certain properties and traits, and th those traits may or may not be useful to you. And of course, blockchain doesn't get its name out of nowhere. It is a chain of blocks. And before you will laugh at, at this slide, it is really the only structural constraint of how this technology works. So basically, the only structural constraint that you need to have a blockchain is that the new block needs to reference the previous one. So in the case of usual implementations, this is usually achieved using hashes of, uh, of the previous blocks. And if you can come with some other solution, if, if the principle stands, if you have a chain of blocks by referencing each new one with the identifier or some other information from the previous one, you have a blockchain. And of course, blocks contain data. But as I said, blockchain is a database. So if you think about the word database, you probably think about MySQL or some other relation, relational database. You probably think about some document databases, MongoDB, maybe some column stores or something like that. Usually, you think about a solution that has a certain structure. So in case of relational data databases, you probably have something like schemas, rows, tables, and so on. But in blockchain, this is a little different because you have none of that. Blockchain is a data, the block is a data structure that you design on your own to solve your own problem. So blockchain for, for cryptocurrency will look totally different from, from blockchain for, for e-commerce, which will in turn look totally different from blockchain, let's say, for transport or some, or some logistics. Yeah? 
you design this structure so that you benefit from it, not that uh, it is required to, for example, store uh, something like uh, you always need to have transactions, like in the case of cryptocurrency. Yeah? You don't need to have that. If you solve e-commerce, you can have orders, you can have uh, statuses, you can have status changes, changes and, and so on. Yeah? You design the blockchain for your own purpose. And of course, the most important and the most popular uh, application of blockchain is, of course, are of course cryptocurrencies. Yeah, but we are not here to talk about the trading of cryptocurrencies. We are not here to talk about how to design one. We are here to talk about so-called general-purpose blockchain. So, how blockchain as a technical solution, as a set of algorithms, as a, as a set of design constraints, de design guidelines, can help you solve your own problems in your own company. So now that we know what is the definition of blockchain, what are we going to talk about? Let's talk about why would you use it in the first place. Because blockchain has a certain set of, of uh, properties that makes it useful for various applications. And first property is, of course, immutability. It is the most basic property because all others derive from, from it. All others need immutability to simply exist in this solution. What I mean about immutability? Once you form a block and put it in the chain, the data in the block cannot change. I mean, it, it must not change. Because if you change it, then basically you have mutable state and you aren't able to preserve any other, uh, any other um, property of, of the blockchain. So once you put the data ins inside, the ch inside the chain, that data doesn't change. But if I have told you just a mi minute pre previously, that mm, blockchain is a database, and you can't change the data once you put it inside, you will say, what, what, what's, what's wrong with the database? Yeah, we need to mutate data. But the answer is, you don't mutate the data, you don't change it, you append it. If you have a blockchain storing, let's say, e-commerce e transactions, then you have something, for example, in one block can have uh, information about creating an order. Someone created an order, and you put it in your blockchain, Basically, defining that certain user has ordered cert certain uh, items and you have it confined in a block. But then, if you, if you want to, for example, let's say pay it, if you want to send it, if you want to cancel it, you need to reference the information from the previous block, the ID of, the, of, the, of that order, and then you need to put an information about operation that will be stored inside the block. So you get all of the atomic operations that, that happen in your domain stored in a secure way. Which brings us to the next property of traceability. I don't know if you have built uh, ever a, a system that needs something like auditing system or some internal like log logging system. Basically, if you have immutable database which is append only and stores all of the atomic operations inside of it, then you get all of the traceability for free by design, because you have all of the information needed to reconstruct the state of the of the, of the chain inside the chain. You don't need any external state. You don't need any database and the API call. Basically, you don't even want to do that because you want to have a central state in which all of the information is simply deemed in integral. And of course, with all the data, you don't store, you don't store only, only the data itself. You also store the information that is able to verify it. And it is usually achieved by storing the hashes of, uh, of the data alongside it. And then you use also cryptography to provide signatures so that uh, you can pr pr prove both the, uh, both the authenticity and the in integrity of the data. Yeah? Integrity by hashes and authenticity by signatures. So you get a data store that, that can be verified and independently of what, what, wherever the data came from. Which brings us to the, to the, to the next trait of being tamper-proof. If you have signatures, if you have hashes, if you have all those cryptographical countermeasures against tampering with the data, then basically you have a tamper-proof data store for which you have a cryptographical guarantee, not just that, mm, I don't know, something is on, or on secure server, something is uh, on an encrypted disk, you get baked security and verifiability inside. You have a tamper-proof data store. And the, all those, uh, all those uh, all those traits brings us to, to the one of the one of the biggest benefits 
the data integrity. Because blockchain as a technical solution is first and foremost designed to preserve the data integrity. Not performance, not scalability, not any other trait, but, in but data integrity. Performance can be achieved, but it is not a core goal. The core goal is to preserve the data integrity at all costs. And of course, given that the data is integral and co contains all of the information inside that is able to verify it, you also get a, a benefit of reproducibility. Because whenever you will run your software based on blockchain with the same blockchain on different machine, you have a guarantee that you will, uh, re uh, that you will arrive at the same state that at any other machine totally independently of, of your own simply achieved. Because you get all of the information inside the blockchain and the, and the application will recreate it in exactly the same way. This is, uh, basically, uh, this is basically for uh, achieving a trade where you, like in the cryptocurrencies, yeah? if, you if you send me two bitcoins, and for example, let's say that I have already five, then everyone independently all over the world will achieve at the conclusion that I have seven bitcoins. If I then send, for example, to some of, some of you five bitcoins, then independently, the, the whole world will converge on the definition that I have two because I have spent five, and some of you have x plus five. It, and it is t totally independently on, some, uh, on any other external uh, circumstances, which makes the blockchain perfectly suitable for building a decentralized applications. Because if you can arrive without any external factors at the same conclusion, then you can simply publish the state and let the whole network converge to, to, a, to a same set of conclusions, yeah? Whether the old order was filled, whether the, some tokens were sent, whether some other thing in your domain has happened, yeah? In the same, same way. And this brings us to the biggest benefit of the blockchain and the first and foremost that you need to uh, take into account when you are considering blockchain for your own, uh, for your own solution. The blockchain effectively removes trust from the system. You don't need to have trust in any government. You don't need to have a trust in any other company, CTO, CEO, company, any other ex external third party. Yeah? You have some kind of trust in the cryptography, in the mathematics behind it, in the design of the system, but there is no external third party factor that can in any way invalidate that, that claims if they are baked in the protocol of, of the blockchain. So you effectively remove trust from, from your system. So now that we know what are the traits of, of, of the blockchain and uh, what, what is it, let's talk a little about when it is used. So what the actual applications exist in, in the world. And the problem is, that the, the blockchain is used simply everywhere. Because not only cryptocurrencies, there are many examples, such as voting, medical records, cloud storage, financial transactions. I don't, I don't want to delve into each of these examples uh, alone because we don't have time for that. But really, if you, if you close your eyes and think and about any industry and about any problem that can be solved with blockchain, someone is doing that with blockchain over the world, yeah? I'm not talking only about Silicon Valley, I'm talking about the whole world, yeah? Really, people are trying. And of course, there, are, there is a hype for blockchain. There, there, is, there are many people who do X, but with blockchain uh, kind, of, kind of stuff. And of course, I don't deny that. There, there, there is many, many thing, uh, kinds of wrong things in, in, inside the blockchain industry, let's call it that. But right now, Many of the ICOs, many, many of the projects are failing, and we are finally in a, let's say, normalization pro, 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 uh, process. That, that, may, that uh, means that we are finally in, in, an, uh, in, in the process of actually thinking and having a real conversation of which of these use cases are valid and which of these use cases actually make sense to, to use with blockchain. Because there are many, but the problem is that it is still an, a, an early research, it is still an early like, a topic, so many people are trying, many people are failing, but if someone is succeeding, then he is succeeding for, for really, really, uh, really good benefit. And of course, there are many other things like smart contracts in e-commerce, digital ide identity, loyalty programs, regulatory reporting, yeah? There are really many, many, many use cases in which blockchain, blockchain really shines. The, the, the question is, how do we integrate the blockchain with the real world? And how, how do we convince people to actually use that in a real world applications? 
and of course cryptocurrencies. Yeah, can, can, I can't can't miss that. Can, can I can't can't talk about this. So cryptocurrencies, there are really many of them. This is a website called Coin360, which tracks the prices of, of various cryptocurrencies. Yeah, and as you see here, each of the rectangles represents a single tradable cryptocurrency. So imagine how many more of them are in development, how many more of them are in the process of just getting a foot in the, in the real world. Yeah? There are really many of them, and they are not only the money, they are also a project with, with, which has a specific vision, which has a specific idea of how to solve some real-world problems efficiently. So now that we have covered what blockchain is, uh, what properties it has, and when it is used, Let's delve into finally into, into into the meat of this of this talk. So, what do you need to consider? What are the technical properties? What are the technical solutions that you need to be to understand? What what do you need to do to actually build one? So, the first thing is that when you are building blockchain, it's not that you just are just implementing it. First, you need to consider an environment in which it will be applied. So, the first decision that needs to be made is that what actual parties will be involved in, inside the whole network. Whether it will be public net, public network, which, like in the case of cryptocurrencies, basically means that everyone is able to download the software, compile it, reverse engineer it, but anyone is able to download the blockchain, analyze it, reverse engineer it, do whatever, whatever they want with it. And basically, you need the most sophisticated security because you need to have an automatic protocol to resolve all of the potential problems, and if someone breaks your cryptography, someone breaks your technical solution, then basically it, it, they break your entire system. Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's that bad. The opposite situation of private blockchain is the situation in which you control the, uh, control the chain as a single entity, a single person, single company, single group of people. Basically, you uh, can have as little or as much security but this is purely academical discussion because basically you're just using a database, but slightly more, more, more complicated. Yeah? The thing is that, that gets interesting is when we consider the shared blockchain, because the shared one is basically when we share the chain between several parties that don't need to trust themselves, but still want to participate uh, in, in some uh, uh, data exchange and want to do it securely. And then you can agree on, a, some, on some protocol and make the, that protocol work so that, for example, if one company sends another an invoice, a document, uh, some other piece of data, and wants to have a proof that someone received it and someone has processed it and, and so on, you can have a protocol in place that, based on whatever blockchain is able to do, can benefit the, 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 the whole ecosystem. Uh, so when you consider what parties are involved in the whole process, then, the, the, then you have a next challenge the actual cryptography, because cryptography is the, is the solution how blockchain achieves the, the uh, desired level of security. So you need to consider uh, secure cryptographical primitives so, so that you, you are sure that whatever you build, it is simply unbreakable, at least at, at, the, at our current knowledge uh, about, the, about the cryptography, about the security at all. So usual and m most popular solution for achieving security are using elliptic, elliptic curve crypt based cryptography because they, it has a very nice trait because usual uh, cryptography based on prime numbers such as RSA is, has, ver has many moving parts for, for uh, it's, the, it's the main um, problem of RSA that it, it really easily can be implemented in insecurely and, and just choosing a, a long key is not, is not enough but in elliptic curve the problem is to choose the curve, the secure curve. And it is uh, able to provide the same level of security as a very long RSA key. If I remember correctly, the 4096-bit uh, uh, RSA key has the same level of security as 223 bits of, of EC key. So you see that it is a key that, that can be even written on a paper, which, which I will show in just a moment. So you are selecting a curve. And of course, you don't need to do that research yourself because you can just choose, uh, choose the same curve that other, other people use. So this is the only moving part in the, in the EC cryptography. And for example, if you think that, blockchain, uh, that Bitcoin is secure, just choose the, the same curve, feed it into, into your uh, cryptographic algorithm, and then you're basically use, using EC, EC cryptography. 
a small, small mathematical primer that uh, cryptography based on the, on the prime numbers basically consists of choosing two very big primes and basically on the infeasibility of finding those primes with the regular computation. Yeah? With elliptical cryptography, is quite different because what you see here right now is the, is the uh, diagram of the, of the specific curves, as you see their names at, at the bottom. And it, it is based on, on the fact that whenever you will draw a straight line through any of, the, of the, them, they are crossed in exactly three places. And coordinates of those places are basically uh, forming the public key and, and, and private key, but in a slightly, uh, slightly more con con convoluted way, but just to give you an idea how and why does it, does it work. And of course, there are very many curves that can be used uh, inside, uh, inside EC cryptography. So I took a liberty of calling OpenSSL EC param minus list curves, which, which, is a, uh, which is a command that lists all of the curves supported by, by uh, OpenSSL at, on your computer. And on my computer, it actually supported, as you see, the, the, that many of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of curves. Yeah? There are many more of them. Some of them are not secure. Some of them are secure. Basically, you need to do your homework. You need to, you need to be aware w of what you're doing because it is the most important part that provides the security of your project. Yeah, and as I said, you have no trust in the system. So if someone breaks your cryptography, then basically the whole system is broken. And if you want to send any kind of message in your system, let's say some, uh, in the case of cryptocurrencies, you, for example, want to send few bitcoins, few Ethereum to some other person in the, in, in, in the network. And then you need a way to, of addressing some other person. So you don't have any central database of, uh, of users. You don't have any central authority which, has, which can tell, tell you which user is which. So you need to have actually an algorithm that based on the private, private and private key, I mean the only data that, that the user has, can devise an actual addressable system. And in the case of uh, Bitcoin, here is an algorithm for generating the uh, address in, in, in the Bitcoin system. I mean, it looks quite convoluted, but it is really very simple because it just involves calling a ready-made function that we have in, uh, in our programming languages. Yeah, So calling SHA-256, repent 160 or, or some other uh, uh, simple, simple information. Basically, it, it can be a really simple function, but this is the way that Bitcoin does it. And a simple, simple example that Given this private key, this is a EC private key, and this public key, after applying those computations, you, uh, you uh, uh, have the result which is called the Bitcoin address. And this is actually something that people are writing down on, on, their, on, the, on the papers. Uh, and I, I think you have heard about it. I mean, they're just writing down the, the addresses uh, on the papers and even memorizing them, because this is way more way easier to memorize or write down than this or, or, or some, other, some other value in this matter. Of course, when you have the security cryptography and you have the addressing system, then you also need an, uh, the hash algorithm to provide the integrity. Because with cryptography, uh, with the elliptical cryptography, you, you provide the authenticity. But you still need an algorithm to, pro to provide the integrity. And here you have an algorithm that is used by Bitcoin it double hashes with SHA-256, the header of the block. And this is the information that, that is an identifier of each block in the system. So the, block, the Bitcoin block header looks like this. You have a block version, which is four bytes. You have 32 bytes of the previous block hash. So as I said, the reference to the previous block. And 32 bytes for a hash of the actual contents of, 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 that, uh, of that block. Four bytes for timestamp four bytes for difficulty, or four, four bytes for nonce. And the actual example of, of such block looks like this. So here you have a Genesis blockchain, gen, gen, uh, Bitcoin Genesis block hash, which looks like this. And then you have a version, which is one. You have a previous block, which looks like this, the all zeros. Basically, you have also the hash of, of, the, of the contents of, of the block. You have the timestamp at which it was generated. Difficulty started with one, and nonce is an incremented value just needed to achieve the hash with a required amount of zeros at the beginning, but we will cover that in, in a moment. So this is an example of a block from the 8th of uh, December from, from last, last year, 
I mean, the, the time at, at which I generated this, the, I, I created this, this slide. So as you see, there are many more zeros because that's the difficulty. And you see that version is still one. The previous block is not zero. It actually refers to something, something that was previous. You have a, a root hash. You have a timestamp. You see that difficulty went out, out, out of the roof. And then you have a nonce, which is incremented to generate the hash with uh, enough amount of zeros. Another thing that needs to be considered is to how to, how to effectively and uh, with a good performance check whether some information is inside block. Because if you uh, download the, the blockchain to, to, to your computer, then you need to, from the Genesis block, you need to recreate all that state up to the latest block that you have in chain. Yeah? So how do you, in case, for example, Bitcoin, check that the block contains only the only thing that you need, so whether you spend some Bitcoins or you have received some Bitcoins. So Mercantly, also called as a binary hash tree, is a data structure that is able to quickly answer that question for you. The example looks like this. You have four, in four pieces of information, A, B, C, and D. You hash them and have H, A, H, B, H, C, and H, D. And then you can form a binary hash tree by hashing each pair of them and up to the root, applying the same uh, information and uh, uh, living in, uh, with the, with the uh, binary hash tree. But the most important part is, uh, is the property called Merkle path. Because if you have information about R, A, H, B, and H, B, so this piece of these three pieces of information, then the binary hash tree can very quickly tell you whether the information that you require is stored inside uh, inside that um, uh, inside that, uh, that that block. So so that perf uh, processing blocks is m much more performant. And of course, I have told you that each block, each new block in the system, references the previous block. But I haven't told you what happens to the first block because I mean the, the, it still needs to be. So to reference something. And of course, you need to protect your system against generating the previous block b before uh, the first one, because then you will be able to provide basically uh, uh, some lies into the system that will be believed. Yeah? So Genesis block is a, is a special block, which is the first one in the chain. And it is, uh, it is um, crafted by the system designer so that whenever systems tries to restore the state from the first block, it always looked look for the block that is hard-coded inside the uh, application code and also uh, starts from this, from this very block. So it won't just ask uh, the network, please give me the first block, because the application already knows what's inside the source code, and someone must have altered the source code to actually change the Genesis block. And in, it, it is used not only to solve a technical, technical problem of the blocks before Genesis, but as you see here, this is a Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, Genesis block. You see that not only technical solution, but also the political message of the whole blockchain system. The Times uh, header from 1st of January of 2009, the first day that, 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 that were the block were, was mined, Chancellor on brink of the second bailout for banks. So as you see here, both the technical solution and the political message. And I have even dug up the, the times for, for, from 3rd of January 2009. As you see, see at the bottom, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So both the technical solution and the political message of the Bitcoin system, which aimed to steer something in, 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 the, in the financial domain. And also, those things that I have told you so far are only the technical algorithms, only the te technical solutions that, that you need to employ to actually be able to, to implement it. Yeah? But the problem is, when you publish your network, when you publish the data uh, on, your, on the network, you need to be able to handle consensus, so hand handle some rejections, handle some problems that may arise because some of the network may wrongfully claim that they, they hold the truth, even, even that they don't. So, Bitcoin does, does it uh, in a spe very specific way. Let's, uh, let's uh, assume that we have uh, three blocks. We have the Genesis block, which is called zero, first, and two. And everything is fine and dandy. Basically, we have a whole network which converts on the, on the three blocks, and everything is OK. But the problem is when two nodes generate two different blocks, called 3.1 and 3.2, then the blocks are 
distributed over the network. And let's say half of the network gets one, another half gets, gets the second. And even let's complicate it a little bit more because it happened, it happened once again. And we have a split brain problem because half of the network has one of, one, one of the chain, half of the network has the, has the other. So how do we uh, achieve a total consensus? So the rule is that the longest chain always wins. So when someone will generate the block 5.1, and let's say that block 5.1 will be uh, will be acquired by by the node which is actually at the block 4.2 the it will discard all the changes up to the last block that that that, uh, that is uh, agreeing with, with the with the chain structure and then we'll reapply we we'll ask the network and reapply all the blocks that lead to the longest the, lo the longest chain the rationale here is that no one will be able to generate uh, generate uh, that, that that many blocks because it is it is simply uh, simply technically infeasible, and why it is infeasible because of the proof algorithms. Because as you s have seen on the, on this uh, example, if someone had enough computational power, he sh could just f uh, flood the network with the blocks and just take over all the networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, like any anything else. Yeah, the problem is, but that with proof algorithms. It, it, he simply can't. He simply can't it, it can't be done. So proof of work w was like this: you need to generate a specific trait of the block so that the network accepts it. In case of Bitcoin, it is a, a hash of the uh, highest amount of leading zeros. So that's what the nonce value is for. You just basically have a static static uh, amount of information that is used to generate a hash, but you increment the nonce value just a simple integer to finally find the data that produces hash with, uh, with uh, desired difficulty, the desired amount of zeros. Of course, it is very computation computationally in in intensive, so uh, there are also other algorithms, such as proof of stake, in which there is a deterministic algorithm, which out of um, the nodes that contain the most value in them, in case of cryptocurrencies, this is, this is nodes which have the most tokens, like most Bitcoins, most, most Ethereum, or something like, uh, something like that, and deterministically, is one of those nodes is, is designated to, to prove that this block is actually valid. The rationale is that no one who, who acquired that much value would invest that value to break the network, effectively lo lo losing that value. So that's the uh, algorithm of proof of stake. There are also many others, such as proof of burn, so that you, you need to burn a specific amount of value by sending it to non-existent address, and then submitting a proof of that transaction to, to your own block. So that, for example, you need to burn some amount of Bitcoins, even though Bitcoin doesn't use proof of burn. Uh, but but uh, let's, let's uh, say just for an example, you need to burn certain amounts of Bitcoin to prove that the block with all those transactions simply is, is valid. There is also a, a algorithm of proof of elapsed time, proof of uh, allocated space, proof of allocated memory. The, there are very many ideas that are used by some experimental projects. Those two are, are most, most popular, but I'm just, just showing this example to, to tell you that th th these are not only two. There are very many, and if you can come with such algorithm to protect your network, then you're totally free to do so. You can even call it proof of my own, no problem with that, just proof that with that algorithm, you can prove that you can uh, save, yourself, save your network from being flooded by adversaries. So right now, we have covered like, all the topics that, that we need to be aware of to, to create a blockchain. But I want to also talk about something more, about, about things that mm, many of the cryptocurrency networks, many of the projects are using to solve some problems be, be, arising from, from the design of blockchain. So first of uh, such things are smart contracts, because in a Ethereum network, you can write programs that are stored alongside all the transactions that are actually run whenever something related to, 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 the, to the account on which they are set up happens. So let's say that, you, for, for example, you, you want to programmatically have a loan system. You have like 1,000 1, tokens, and you want to pay someone else 100 each month. You can write a program that will be run on the virtual machine of each, uh, each of the verifiers that will be actually able to itself push the transaction onto the network by just checking that, okay, month elapsed, 
so I can send you another another 100. Yeah, you can have something like programmable programmable money, and this is called smart contracts. And of course, it isn't limited to cryptocurrencies, but Ethereum is the most prominent example of of it. You can really have callbacks for all the uh, receiving all the states that you that you have in your application, modifying them them in the, the deterministic way and actually providing a business value that uh, that is able to be to be achieved by store, by storing those prog programs alongside the data there is also a lightning network which is an attempt by bitcoin network to sh to uh, to solve the issue of uh, throughput because bitcoin network has a very low throughput uh, as far as the member is uh, free transactions per second so it's very very slow so that's why lightning network which basically works like this someone opens the channel and then Everyone that connects to this channel is able to uh, to exchange the money instantly, but then only the sum of the, the, trans the transactions is actually codified as a block and put uh, to, to, to the main chain. Yeah, so you get all of the operations uh, that happen instantly, but you just uh, you just send it back to the block once you reach some some threshold like uh, the the li limit of the transac transactions or um, in in the current channel. Also, the topic of mining. If you have ever wondered what, what is the, that all that mining is about, basically mining is calculating the nonce of the, of, of the block so that it achieves a cert certain hash. So that's like the defini definition of mining. There are also solutions called, uh, called uh, I, I call them at least, non-blockchains. I mean, the, the solutions that, that uh, aim to provide the same level of security, same level of, uh, of utility, but not using the blockchain per se. So there is something called IOTA Tangle, and IOTA Tangle is basically, basically a graph, a graph that automatically resolves whatever happens on it. And basically, when you put uh, some information in blockchain, you need to prove that you have created it by, by some proof algorithm. In, in case of IOTA, you need to reference some, uh, at least two, some other pieces of information inside the graph. And when you receive the desired number of proofs from other pieces of information, then it, that information is deemed valid and is inlined in the state so that so that the, the IOTA tangle doesn't grow in, in, indefinitely. Right now, I also want to talk a little about a very sim simplistic example of how it could be achieved. So, hash chain is a name that describes the blockchain without any consensus uh, algorithm. So, basically, just a, just a technical solution, the technical storage. So, let's say that we have like four dependencies, the storage, let's say, in SQLite, we, we, because you can perfectly fi find storage story blocks in any kind of the database. Let's say we store it in, rather than in files, we store it in SQLite. Then we have an open SSL signer with the private and public keys. We have an infant dispatcher that will be able to react on the new block that came to, that came to our system. We have a Genesis block with our handcrafted input, and we just create a, an object which receives all those dependencies. So right now, if you wanted to apply some operations by creating new blocks, then you, let's say that you, you have uh, three operations. Create account, create account with credits, and send credits. Yeah? As you see, we are here applying a single uh, operation per block, but it really ca can be many more. That's just for simplifying the example. So what, right now, we are creating account with an alias of A and name alpha. Then we create the same account, but with credits, 1,000. And then we, send, uh, we are sending credits from Z to A. And each of the blocks will be created, will reference the previous one, and will be validated on each of the nodes that it will be distributed on. So let's talk about when, uh, when uh, it, could, it, 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 could wrong. it could be wrong. So let's say that, for example, as you see here, Z sent to A 100, so it has 900. If it attempts then to, sa to send another 1,000, it doesn't have one. So each of the... Uh, nodes that receive the block claiming that Z uh, wants to send 1,000 credits to A, the block will be rejected and the network will not converge on the decision. If we want to se send some credits from non-existent sender, if you want to create a duplicate account, yeah, as you see here, you have a distributed consensus because you have an uh, you have a, a cryptographic proof that this operation, even if malicious, was created by some other person, and you have both the technical uh, countermeasures in place and the semantical countermeasures in, in place because uh, 
receiving on the receiving end the, node, the network node will not only validate the technical correctness the hashes the signatures and so on but it will also validate the, the semant semantical operations such as whether you can close an order that that was already closed yeah so this this works exactly like this and of course you can have uh, many more operations in a, in a single block you can even process them out of order such as create account D, send credits from E to D, uh, and then create accounts from, with credits uh, with an alias of E. Basically, you can, you can do everything that, that you want, and it is really, I mean, it is really that simple on a, on a conceptual level. It is hard on prov providing an actual protocol which will securely, mm, securely provide a protocol of communication that isn't able to be broken by just stuffing up uh, some, some random, random data, data inside. So, of course, blockchain as a technical solution is, all, is not all fine and dandy. There are some technical challenges, and of course, we need to be aware, uh, aware of them to actually implement, implement it successfully. So the first problem is, of course, the conflict resolution, by which I mean the consensus problem. So the consensus algorithm is really the hard part, because if you have solved the consensus algorithm by any other means, I mean, like, for example, consensus algorithms such as, such as Paxos, Raft, proof of work, some other algorithm, yeah? If you have done this, then you have really done the majority of work by de to, de to design a secure and well-designed blockchain. The other thing is integration with existing systems, because, of course, not all systems are, uh, are prepared to work with, uh, with uh, pieces of information, with the actions that happen in the domain. Many systems rely on the mutable state, on, on ability to rely on being able to mutate the state in place. I mean, uh, please, uh, I mean, let's ra raise your hand you, if you have never uh, live, live changed the production database, yeah? So I see no hands, uh, hands up, so I, I won't raise mine. Uh, and as, as you see here, in blockchain, it's simply not possible. I mean, it is possible if you can regenerate the whole blockchain from, from scratch. But you can't do this once you have published that information to some other network, and some other network will just reject all your blocks because the, they don't match the signatures. Yeah, so you need to be prepared. And basically, the any changes inside inside the protocol are really hard to coordinate. So they need to be done in the first place in the, in the in a well, well manner. Security, by which I mean uh, secure cryptography and secure primitives. I mean secure process of cryptography. If you manage to do it wrong, system will be simply broken. I mean, in the case of Bitcoin of, of Ethereum, this is enormous incentive for all wrongdoers, for all malicious adversaries to actually break the system and claim all the Bitcoins for themselves, yeah? Or and just, uh, I mean, exchange them for some, for some money, let's say uh, euros or, or dollars, and then just disappear, yeah? There is, an, there is really enormous incentive, yeah? That's why all those cryptocurrencies must have the at most, the most secure security, most secure cryptography that, that is possible uh, in this world, yeah? Performance, scalability, throughput. As I said, the traits that are not baked into the, in, into the blockchain as a solution, you need to work around it, yeah? You need to have a solution that will process the blocks effectively, uh, that will process them efficiently, so, so that you can achieve a bearable throughput because if you will employ the most secure cryptography and like wire everything together so, so that the system is unbreakable but then you are able to process one block per hour then of course it simply won't work and uh, the supervisor of, of, the, of the company that you work for probably will ask for a little change to that incentives because if you are going to especially in the case of cryptocurrencies but in the case of any public blockchain what makes me as a user of your blockchain able and may, makes me want to use your software, makes me want to use and, uh, and like use my, use my power, use, use, use my current and so on, and pay for this to maintain the node of your application. You need to think about the incentive structure. In the case of Bitcoin, for example, it is uh, if you mine the block by using your power, you will get a few Bitcoins back, yeah? And Bitcoins are, are right now w uh, w uh, worth quite, quite, quite a few bucks, so basically, there, the incentive is there, and people are doing, the, doing this not from altruistic views, but because they, they simply want, want more money by exchanging the computation in, in, uh, in, uh, in their computers. Hard forks, because 
when, you, for example, the consensus algorithm will, will not suffice and you want to change the protocol, and someone of you, some of your users will just break and tell, okay, well, we won't accept the changes, we won't accept the new version of the software, we won't accept new block structure or something, then you have a hard fork. You have a two split brain problems because, because uh, someone will uh, use the old version, someone will use the next version. And all things like how to make all the old addresses not, not being uh, duplicates of the, all, all the other ones. How to make, um, how to make it mm, so that uh, no, no one is able to craft the address, uh, for, like mix it, yeah? so like convince you that you, you need to send something to some other address by, uh, and effectively losing your, your tokens. Yeah? But these are all the problems that you need to, to consider. And of course, the network security, the 51% attack, what will happen if someone has so much uh, computing power that is able to overrule your, your proof of work algorithm if you use it? In the case of Bitcoin, it's, it's, it's currently infeasible. But in, your, in case of your network, if you have that incentive in place, someone will probably do, do that, will rent all those AWS machines and will attempt at, at, at doing that. And you, have, you need to at least think about countermeasures. How will you solve the problems? So to summarize, the blockchain is the right solution, but you need to triple check whether you have the right kind of problem. And I'm not here to propose a, uh, a hype bandwagon to rewrite all, these, all your applications with blockchain tomorrow, because it is simply not feasible, uh, that, that's for once, and, it, and probably 90% of, of your problems doesn't fit the blockchain. Basically, the question that you need to ask yourself is, is that, do I need a distributed consensus? If I do, then blockchain is a quite a good, good solution. If I don't, then blockchain is probably not a good solution, but that depends, of course, of the details. I mean, if you want to, uh, to have me consult your idea, I'm pretty happy, ha happy to do so, but really, in the like, majority of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the answers, I can tell you already, the answer will be, will be no, you need some other solution, but not blockchain. Maybe in some parts of blockchain, maybe, maybe cryptography, maybe proof algorithm, maybe something else, but not blockchain, not the whole solution. And of course, given that I have told you that uh, each of the block contains all of the operations needed to restore the, uh, the state of the system, as you see here, we have basically event sourcing, and, uh, and as I like to, to, to call it, we have event sourcing on steroids because we have event sourcing with all the benefits and integrity and authenticity and security. Yeah? If you need event sourcing with all those traits, then yes, blockchain may be a good solution. And of course, we are just scratching surface. Yeah? I just wanted to really go through virtually all kinds of topics so that you get a foot for thought for Googling, for searching for information. There are many uh, resources at, 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 at the next slides that, that you can read that you can do to improve your knowledge about, about the system, because it is really a vast field of research. Mathematics, cryptography, like all of the industries, it is really a very er early field, and it is re really a young field, and the uh, research is really, really buzzing uh, pr pretty, pretty well. So now, given that I have uh, talked for way too long, maybe there are some questions. Yes. Wait a second, just wait. Uh, maybe some. We'll we have, we have a microphone, just a sec. Tomas, you are a real after lunch hero. I mean, you, were, you woke him up. Hey, hello. Yes? Well, thanks for the talk first. And uh, yesterday on workshop, uh, CQRS workshop, yeah. actually, we had a question, which is something really rela related to this. Um, what if, in a light of recent events with GT, uh, GDPR? Oh, yes. That's and very when good you question. have like user data there and you just have to delete them, yeah. do you re recreate the whole chain or you maybe use some encrypted data or something? Yeah, and uh, as of course, this is the same question for event sourcing. Yeah, basically, the event sourcing has the same problem. If you put all the data that you have inside the events, that's the same thing that you, that, you, that you have when you put that in, inside the blockchain. But the problem is, in event sourcing, you can always like, rewrite the events. I mean, you shouldn't do that, but you can rewrite them, you can delete the data. Yeah. In, in the case of blockchain, you need to think ahead of it. And probably, if you really need to be compliant with GDPR, you need to be aware that the blockchain needs to contain only the, like, the data that is needed to provide the, um, 
sorry, I have lost the word, but uh, integrity of the system. So, for example, just some, uh, some uh, synthetic IDs, some values, some date times, and so on, but none, no uh, user identifiable data. Yeah? So, for example, you store all the data that you want to prove, but you don't store any personal data. You, for example, store, store, store it in a either separate blockchain, you store it in a summarization database, and so on, just store the identifiers in external systems, and you just store in the blockchain the information that you want to prove. Yeah? For example, you don't want to prove that I have sent you like 1,000 euros. You want to prove that, I, uh, that user 1345 sent 100 euros uh, to user 5387, and then those references are for the external system that you have in, in your own company that is uh, just a relation database that you can clear at any time. Yeah? Thank you. No problem. Any other question? Any questions? Yes? Dziękuję, Tomasz, na świetne lekcjach. Był bardzo detaliczny. Nie ma sprawy. Okay, so uh, because uh, immu immutability of the, of the data, uh, we have now faced the problem of collecting a lot of data that is that are not needed, but must be processed. So how how we to, to tackle that problem? Because we are generating new data, new data, new data, and that data needs to be propagated, needs to be recreated on on uh, new new nodes, and that's became the bigger and bigger problem. So if we want uh, to have like distributed system and we are ending on uh, maybe we will end on having some somewhere in the cloud because uh, normal users cannot process uh, all data that needs to be processed. I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but uh, what I have understood is that you have loads of data that you don't want to grow and grow. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that can be solved by actually snapshotting the data. Because, for example, uh, of course, in the case of Bitcoin blockchain, the data will, will, will be growing indefinitely. Yeah? You can, of course, prune some, some nodes and so on, but the whole blockchain, the whole nodes, uh, as it is called in the blockchain nomenclature, will simply grow. Right now, the, block, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain has like something like uh, one, one, uh, 160 gigabytes. And of course, this is, this is a quite, quite an amount. So you can have a threshold at which if you process the data of, 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 the, of the blocks, then you keep only the last, let's say, 100 blocks, 1,000 blocks or something, and then you just, you just rewrite the previous blocks as the, as the snapshots, yeah? So you have like another uh, blocks, another blockchain with, uh, with just the snapshot, with just the desired state, and then you just have information in it, the cryptographic secured, that this blockchain was generated from the base one up to the, this point. Yeah, so it, it it can be done. I think that we, we, you could benefit with uh, talking. Uh, I mean, like after the conference in the, in the greater detail. But yes, snapshotting may be an answer. Another question. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. Any more questions? So I mean, everything is clear. If there is there, are, sorry. <laughs> If there are, uh, 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 if you want, there are many resources. Slides will be, of course, published. So, uh, as you see here, there are many, many, many resources that you, you can use to really level up your knowledge about blockchain and everything re required. And right now, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tomasz Kowalczyk. Thank you very much, Tomasz. Thank you. And as are you getting ready to get off the stage, I will just remind our audience that we have evaluation polls and please take some and do give us feedback. Uh, the poll is available through the application you have installed or you can find it on social media under hashtag PHPSRB. As far as uh, GitHub and JetBrains are concerned, by filling in the poll you will be able to get GitHub uh, and JetBrains licenses. We all know you like them. Also. Pay a visit to Goarana and uh, win some interesting prizes. And if you want a drone, visit SiteGround and find out what it takes to win one. Now we'll have a short refreshments break. See you back here in 35 minutes. See you here at 4 o'clock sharp. Thank you.